Okay. Who can tell me what that word is? Bereshit, which means in the beginning. How many of you would like to have been there? Wow. That would have been incredible to watch God create all of the heavens and the universe. Okay, I got a couple of questions, a little quiz, a test. How many of you like tests? All right. You're going to get one anyway. How old were Cain and Abel when they fought? How old do you think Cain and Abel were when Cain killed Abel? All right, just keep that. We'll, we'll look at that later on. I just wanted you to be pondering that. And the other question is, what was the first commandment? What was the first commandment? Let there be light. That's exactly right. Here in Genesis 1, 1 through 3, here we are. Can you see the screen? There was darkness, it says, on the face of the deep. But let's look at this. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. In Hebrew, tohu and bohu, it was just a waste. And then it says, darkness was on the surface of the deep, but God's Spirit was hovering over the surface of the waters, and God said, see the dove? Barely? On the top, right? And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And if you think about it, that water was living water. Now, God said that there be light, but there was no sun. There was no moon. There were no stars. That wasn't until the fourth day. So what was the source of the light then? Well, look at this. Here's what I want you to remember. You're going to find that the oceans, the seas, represent the nations of the world. In the Bible, the seas, the water, represents the Gentile nations. So think of this as parallel, the creation of the universe with the creation of Gentile nations. Look at Isaiah 60, verse 1 through 5. Arise and shine, for your light is come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you, for behold, darkness will cover the earth, gross darkness the people, but the Lord will arise on you, and his glory will be seen on you, and the Gentiles will come to your light. And kings, to the brightness of your rising, lift up your eyes and see everyone's gathering themselves together, and they're coming to you. Your sons will come from far. Your daughters will be nursed at your side. Then you will see and flow together. Your heart will fear and be enlarged because the abundance of the sea is converted to you. The forces of the Gentiles will come to you. So do you see the abundance of the sea is equivalent to the forces of the Gentiles? So the darkness is on the face of the deep. It's just, it's just like a mass of there's no really people of God. And then God creates the nation of Israel, and they're to bring the light. And then all the nations come to that light. Look at Revelation 17, 1. Now, this is the beginning of the book, and now we're at the end of the book. There came one of the seven angels that had seven bulls, and he spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot that sits upon what? Many waters. Revelation 17, 15 goes on to say, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. Does that make sense? Am I connecting the dots for everybody here? And then look what happens in John 8 through 12. This is right after the Feast of Tabernacles. John 7, 
Feast of Tabernacles, John 8, Shemini Atzeret, just this last weekend is when this happened. And he says, Yeshua spoke to them again and saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me doesn't walk in darkness, but has the light of life. This harkens right back to Genesis 1 at creation. Now, so here we are. We have the oceans. We have the seas. And Yeshua is the light. Now, when you look at seas, there's the oceans, but the seas are basically part of the ocean. Uh, here's the list of like 12 seas. Uh, for example, the Red Sea is number two. You know where that's at. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea is number one. But this kind of lists all the seas. And when it talks about the seas being converted to you, it's referring to all of the nations. Now, here we see the light, right? And we know Yeshua is the light. That was the light at creation, Yeshua was the light at creation. He was the source of that light. But look at Proverbs 6.23. The commandment is a lamp and the law is what? Light. So when we look at this, we see you both Yeshua and the law is the light. The law existed before creation. The law didn't come with Moses. It came written with Moses but it existed before creation. Think about that. That is amazing to me. Now, look at this. Psalm 119, verse 129 through 131, and I have on your notes the letter pay. What does pay mean in Hebrew? Mouth. mouth. You have a mouth that is speaking, and what do we see here? Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore does my soul keep them. Wow, he keeps his testimonies. The entrance of your words give what? That's why the minute he opened his mouth, there was light. Because him opening his mouth and speaking brings light. But look at this. His words that give light also gives understanding to the simple, here it is, I opened my mouth. God opens his mouth, speaks the commandments. I opened my mouth and I panted and I longed for your what? Commandments. Wow, the light came with commandments. He spoke at the beginning of creation and there was light and with the light is his commandments as well. His Torah was the light at the beginning, the written Torah, and he was the physical Torah. You follow me? He's the living Torah. So we have the living Torah and we have the written Torah that describes who God is, what he likes, what he doesn't like. If you get married, you want to find out what your spouse likes and doesn't like. Okay. What if he's allergic to flowers? Are you going to give her flowers? Yes. What if he's allergic to chocolate? Oh, I love you, dear. Here's some chocolate. <laughs> no. So God described himself so we can see what he likes and what he doesn't like. As a matter of fact, this is incredible. Science, look what they have discovered. Scientists just captured a flash of light that sparks when a sperm meets an egg. At the very beginning of life, there's a spark of light. Can you believe that? Only God, everyone, it says in John, who lights every man who comes into the world. There it is. Every human being, there's that light. He lights everyone when they come into the world, which also tells you at the very moment life begins. His light is life. Okay, moving on. Psalm 104, 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, my soul. The Lord, my God, you are very great. You're clothed with honor and majesty. He covers himself with light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Man, light is his garment. Now, here's what's amazing. The Hoff Torah portion that goes with this Torah portion is Isaiah 42, which has to do 
with the creation of Israel. So Genesis 1 is the creation of the world, the creation of the universe. And the Haftor portion is the creation of Israel. Look at this. Isaiah 42, 1. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentile nations. Who is the consummate Israeli? Yeshua. This, he's speaking to Yeshua. It doesn't say they will bring justice to the nations, but he will bring justice to the nations. This is specifically talking about God's servant, Yeshua. Now, look at the next verses, verse 3 and 4. A bruised reed he will not break. A faintly burning wick he will not quench. He, notice we just noticed Isaiah 42, 1, he brings forth justice. And here again, it says, he will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands are waiting for his Torah. This is not just the Israeli nation because it says he, not they. It's specifically referring to Yeshua first. Okay, and as an Israeli, it refers, but it's speaking to an individual. Now, do you know why it says a bruised reed he won't break? What does that mean? Okay, earlier it talks about how Israel was leaning upon Egypt for their protection. And the Bible says Egypt is like a bruised reed. If you're leaning on a bruised reed, it will break and it could pierce your hand. That's literally what it says in the Bible. And so when it comes to Messiah, everyone would break a bruised reed so no one would get hurt. Messiah doesn't break it. He heals it. He's not going to break a bruised reed like everyone else does. He's going to heal it. A smoking flax or burning wick with just the smoke, he doesn't puff it out. He tries to set it on fire again. So many of us feel like we've gone out. But there's still smoke, and God could blow his spirit on you, and the fire can come back again. Now, we just saw in Isaiah 42, he will bring justice to the Gentile nations. And again, he's going to bring justice to the earth. And how does he do it? By bringing the light of the Torah. Now, look at Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given and the government's going to be on his shoulder his name is wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end and upon the throne of david and upon his kingdom to order it and to do what establish it with judgment and with justice okay from henceforth even forever and the zeal of the lord of hosts will perform this god is all about judgment and justice what is the one thing that is corrupt here on earth Judgment and justice. There is no judgment. There is no justice. It's all, everything is political. Now look at Isaiah 42, back to the Haftor portion. This is the verses 5 and 6. And talk about matching up to Genesis 1. It says, thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens, who stretched them out, he who spread out the earth and that which comes out of it. He who gives breath to its people and spirit. And what did God do in Genesis? He breathed upon man and his spirit. Okay. And to those who walk in it. Now look at this. I, and who is I here? It says the Lord. Let's look at the text. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I'm going to hold your hand. I'm going to keep you and make you a covenant for the people as a light for the Gentile nations. Here is someone from the tribe of Judah, meaning he's a Jew, who's going to bring the light to the Gentiles. Is there any other Jew in history that has brought light to the Gentiles? Zippo. No. But what you may not have caught, the word you here is in the singular. It's not in the plural. He's talking about a specific individual. And it does not say he will make you a covenant between you and the earth. No, no, no. 
He becomes the covenant. I'm going to make you the covenant between the Father and earth. So he becomes the covenant. There's not a covenant between heaven and earth. He is the covenant between heaven and earth. Here we see he is the covenant between man and the creator. And it's not written on stone. It was written on flesh from the beginning. And in Genesis 2, 7, it says the Lord God formed man of the dust. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. As a matter of fact, look at Psalms 33, 6. It says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Can you imagine? You see how big some of these stars are? I mean, they're, they make our sun look teeny. And God breathes them out. Wow, wow, big star. Look at 2 Timothy 3.16. Every scripture is what? Wow. And who, which one of us thinks we're the editor that can edit what he said and say, yo, this is no good. I would be very careful claiming to be God's editor. John 1, 1 through 5. It says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And it says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning, in the beginning, Brashit, with God. Everything was made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was what? That, we just read that. And the light is what shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In the beginning, let there be light. There was darkness, the oceans. And what did he do? He brought the light of Messiah and the light of the Torah. So what do we see in Genesis 1, 4, and 5? God saw that light and saw that it was good. So God divided the light from the darkness. He called the light day. The darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning. Day one. Now, where it says God saw the light. Here it is. I'll give you a little Hebrew sc scroll. Right here is Ha'or. Okay, you have Aleph Tav, Ha Or, Aleph Vav Resh. You know what's amazing about that here? God created light. That's like the universe. And here God has the light. Well, there's a couple of fascinating things I want to give to you here. Let's see. The light, as you know, was the Torah, right? And we have or Aleph Vav Resh, but before it is the Aleph Tav Ha Or. Ha is the, the light. I think it's fascinating that it's Aleph Tav light, which means this light is produced by the Aleph Tav or God. It's God's light. It's not a man-made light. You're not going to believe this, but as many of you know, every Hebrew letter has a numerical value. And Aleph is, or the Aleph is one, and the Tav is 400. The hay is the five, all F1, bar six, 200. Guess what that adds up to? 212 plus 401 is 613. That's how many commandments are in the Torah, and that's why the Torah is the light. That's the light. Amazing. The Torah is the light. Well, guess what? Right here, uh, who can read that? The first letter is what letter? Bait, and we know bait means in, like in the beginning, the first letter is bait, in, and then you have the tav, which makes what sound? T, then the vav is an O, the resh makes a R sound, and the hay makes, that is in Torah, that's the word Torah. Do you see that? Bait is in, and there's T-O-R-H, in Torah. I want to sure everybody sees that. In Torah. Guess what is in Torah? 613. The Torah is light. And right here we see the phrase in Torah is 613. Imagine that. Another coincidence. Well, guess what else? The word for light 
in Genesis 1 appears, uh, Genesis 1, 3 through 5, appears five times. But it is spelled Aleph Bav Resh, as you saw. Yet the same Hebrew word, when used the sixth time, in verse 14, when he creates the light, the two lights, the sun and the moon, in Genesis 1.14, he creates the lights in the heaven. But now it is spelled differently. It's always spelled Aleph Bav Resh until the sixth time when the lights of the heaven, referring to physical light, but this time it's spelled without the letter Bav. It's just Aleph Resh. In other words, it's defective because that light isn't as bright as God's light from the beginning. You only see this in Hebrew. You don't see it in English. But in Hebrew, when God creates the light, it's Aleph Bav Resh. But then when he makes the man-made lights, it's just Aleph Resh. It's not as bright as his light. But these are the kind of things you're only going to see in the Hebrew. Uh, what we see here is a case of the complete or full spelling of a Hebrew word versus an incomplete or defective spelling. Spelling a word and its complete or full form signifies totality and integrity. Spelling it in its incomplete or defective form indicates imperfection. The light that shone for the first three days of creation was a perfect and full light, while that which shone when the sun and the moon were created was less perfect or not as strong of a light. So, when they appeared, the other light disappeared. Where did God's light go? You wouldn't need the sun and the moon if God's light was still there. So God withdrew his light, and now we have the light of the sun and the moon. But it's coming back in Revelation. It says you have no more need for the sun or the moon because God's light is there. So God hid his light. All right? The great light of creation was now located in the Torah. He clothed it in the Torah, and that's where the light remains hidden until we uncover the light. Look at Isaiah 42, 21 through 23. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will do what? He's going to magnify the Torah. He's going to make it honorable once again. In other words, much of Christianity wants to throw out the Torah, say it's done away with, but then you're being God's editor. And God is saying, no, I want to magnify it, just the opposite. I want to make it greater and make it honorable again. But he says the problem is that people are robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes. They are hid in prison houses, for they are a prey, and no one delivers for a spoil. And no one says, restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear? For the last days, the time to come here is for the last days. In the end times, in the last days, there are going to be people who are trying to magnify the Torah and make it honorable, which is what here at El Shaddai we try to do, is to accomplish this prophecy. Acheron is the word, and it is time to restore the Torah back to its proper place. Magnifying the Torah and making it honorable, once again, is part of that restoration there is a creator who loves us, and he wants to be loved. The fact that there is a creator is what gives meaning and purpose to creation. Think about that statement. If there wasn't a creator, what meaning and purpose is there in life? It's everyone out for themselves. It's a fight. Seriously, if there's no creator, everyone is on their own to get all they can get, and then your life is over. Oh, it would be horrible not to believe in a creator that loved us. Look at Acts 3, 19 through 21. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins can be blotted out, so the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Yeshua HaMashiach, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must keep a hold of until when? The times of the restoration of all things. Okay, that God has spoken by the mouth of all those holy prophets since when? Since yeah. the world began. Guess what? Prophetically, we're living in the time of the restoration of all things, and Yeshua isn't coming back until that's done. So if you want the Messiah to return, you better, you better be magnifying the Torah, make it honorable again. 
Golly. Okay, I'm going to have to go real fast. Do you mind? Sorry, I already went over. Do you mind if I just go a little bit more? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. As I said, Ecclesiastes 3, 1, to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose. And a time, one of them is a time to be born. You know what that means? You were born on purpose. I don't care what your circumstances were. If uh, you happen to be the product of illicit relationships or whatever it is. I don't care. God had you come on purpose. He needed you at this particular time. You could have been born any time in history, but God needed you right now. Why? Because in any relay race, they always save the fastest for last. We're the last because God respects and honors and needs you for the race at this time. So now's not the time to get up. It's time to get your butt moving. So, God, in his daytimer, had appointed your day in history for you. He had a day just for you, and it says all of our days are numbered. He created you on purpose, and so now your life has great meaning and significant purpose. How can you think you don't have any reason to live? What are you talking about? Have you talked to God about that lately? Okay, let me just show you some verses here real quick. Okay, what is the last word of the Torah? If you're looking at the Torah, Genesis, Deuteronomy, what is the very last word of the Torah? The Torah. Israel, that's what it says on the right. And now we've rolled back the scroll, and now we're starting with Genesis. And what is that word on the left? Bereshit, which means in the beginning. Well, what's amazing is if you hook that together, since it's circular, the last letter is the Lamed, the first letter is the Beit, and then when it hooks together, that forms... The word lev, which is heart, the Torah is God's heart. And the lamed by itself is a shepherd's staff representing control and authority. And the bait means what? House or really home. And what controls the home is the heart. The heart. That's, I love my Torah. The Torah is, to, is the heart of God, and that's what's to, uh, supposed to control the house. Here is the 22 letters of the Hebrew Aleph Beit. There's 10 on one side, 10 on the other side, and the Aleph and the Lamed is top and bottom. And right there, Melech in the order of the Hebrew means king. And here, the Aleph and the Lamed is El or Elohim. So God is the king is what we see there. And Aleph means to be strong. Lamed is authority, so it means he is the strong authority. So what do we have here? What do we do? We begin with Bereshit. Bereshit. All right? So here is the first phrase in Hebrew, and I want you to notice in Bereshit, there's the word, the first word, in the beginning and I want you to notice the first three letters of the first word are the same three letters of the second word. So in the very word, in the beginning, is the word created. Do you see that? Now watch this. So here we have Bereshit bara. Right? Does everybody see that? Well, Aleph, Av, is father. Ben is son. Ruach is spirit. So in the beginning, we see it involved the father, the son, and the spirit. All three were involved. And if you look at Bereshit, if you notice the bait is a whole lot bigger, all right? Well, if you separate it and you have bait and Reshit, that becomes just the Reshit without the bait. Well, guess what? Reshit, what does Reshit mean? It means the first, specifically a first fruit. It means to be first in place, first in time, first in order, first in rank, the beginning, the chiefest, the remnant. That's what those mean. And rosh, you see in the word, means head. And that big bait, as I said, is house or home because in the beginning, God's purpose was to make a home for his kids. Just like you want to prepare the nursery. But guess what else? There's more. But wait. In the beginning is Bereshit, but if you separate that, Reshit is also a name for the Messiah, 
the Messiah is known as Ray Sheet. Now, bait can be translated as in, but it can also be translated as for or by. So that word Bereshit also means that creation was by the Messiah, for the Messiah, in the Messiah. Now look at this next verse. Where am I? Oh, well, look at Colossians 1, 16 through 18. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, in earth, visible, invisible, where the thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, everything was created by him, for him, he is before all things, and by him everything consists. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, Rashid, the firstborn from the dead, and all things he might have the preeminence right here. And that one word. See, this is why you can't look at one thing and think, like Christianity thinks there's only one right answer. There's over 70 right answers. And you can see it. All this time I've spoken on one word. But look at this. This is what's amazing. Okay, here we go. Watch this. Let's go to Isaiah 48, 16. Come you near to me and hear this. I have not spoken in secret from when? Oh, we're looking at the word the beginning. From the time that it was, there am who? I. And he says, and now the Lord God and his spirit has sent me. You got all three. You got the Lord God. You got his spirit, and he's sending me, Yeshua. Wow, isn't that fascinating? Uh, and of course, Messiah was the firstborn. And in Proverbs 34, it says, Who ascended to heaven and came down? Who gathered wind in his fist? And then it says, What is his name and what is his son's name? And in Psalm 2, 7 through 9, the Lord says, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And that says, you will break everyone with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Right? Well, look at Revelation. The woman brings forth a man-child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Revelation 19, 15, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that he with it would smite the nations and he shall rule them with what? A rod of iron. I wonder who that could be. Okay, now... Uh, I got one more verse. Oh, no, I don't. <sighs> we'll have to come back. I'll try to get this all finished. I'll come back. We were almost done. Oh, let me go on. Okay. Look at this. Revelation. Well, first off, patterns, 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 patterns. We just saw that must, uh, it says, oh, let's see. Some people say Israel is God's firstborn. It says that in the Torah. This, that's why at the Exodus, he says, you kill my son, I'll kill your son to Pharaoh. So Israel is God's firstborn. But for Israel to be God's firstborn, there has to be one in the heaven because that's a pattern. Think about that. But look at this. Here's Jer I'm going to bring up Jeremiah. Here we go. Sparks flying everywhere. And he says, it's not my word like a fire. Okay. <clears throat> But look at this. He also says, I'll, let me show you the next picture. Boom. His word is not only like a fire. His word also breaks the rock into pieces with his hammer known as Israel. In Jeremiah 51. Uh, 51. Now, like these is he who is <clears throat> the portion of Jacob. He's the one who formed all things. Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. And you are my hammer and weapon of war. With you, I'll break nations into pieces. I destroy kingdoms. With you, I break in pieces the horse and the rider. With you, I break in pieces the chariot and the chair tear. So we're going to stop there. And let's stand and pray. That I go quicker next time. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Avinu Malkenu, our Father King, we just thank you right now for your nation of Israel, and we pray right now that you will use them as a hammer to break the enemy in pieces. Father, we just pray right now that your spirit would just surround them, that you would uh, fill them with repentance uh, toward you, that they would all turn back to you and to your Torah. Father, we just want to pray for all those who have been kidnapped. We pray for the families of all those who have been sacrificed and murdered. Father, we just pray that even as the ground war has begun, Lord, that uh, your will would be done 
Father, we just uh, pray for the protection of every child, uh, uh, every innocent on the Palestinian side and on the Israeli side. We pray for the peace and the life of every innocent person. <clears throat> and Father, we just pray right now too. We just thank you so much that we can be the light of your Torah to the nations. I thank you for all those around the world that are joining us, all those uh, that are local that are joining us. Father, and uh, our goal totally is to be a light to the nations. So we thank you for any tithes or offerings that come in, Father, that we could accomplish not our goal, but your goal in being that light to the nations. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Here we go. Can you believe there's so much in Genesis? I mean, we haven't barely even touched the, more than the first chapter. But here we are. Here we go. I think it's interesting that John in Revelation saw the light at creation. In the book of Revelation, look at Revelation 1, 12 and 13. It says, I turned to see the voice of the one that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks was one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, about with the paps with the golden girdle, girdle. You know what's amazing? He's clothed with a garment. And they just got done saying that God is with light, is clothed with the garment. And here he is, the light, and he's clothed with the garment. So he's seeing Yeshua, who is the Aleph Tav, or the beginning and the end. Right here is the ancient Aleph Tav. Now I have it above the fourth menorah. You will see why here in a second. But what he sees is Yeshua as the light of the world in the middle of the lamp. Okay, here we go. Here is Bereshit. Say Bereshit. Bereshit. Bara. Bara. Elohim. Elohim. Et. et. Hasha, hasha Maim. The et. et. Haaretz. Haaretz. Which means, in the beginning, created God, the heavens, and the earth. And notice that fourth word is the Aleph Tav, and it's not translated. And Yeshua is the Aleph Tav. That's what he saw. Now, let me see if I... Okay, let me say this. Well, I'll have to show you this way. Okay, the letter Vav, right here. It is the beginning of the sixth word. If you count the letters, it is the 22nd letter. Okay? Does everyone understand that? The bob is like a nail, and it connects things, which is why here it is connecting heaven and earth. You following me? That, the vav is like a conjunction. It means the word and. But here you have the vav all left tav, and the first use is connecting the heavens and the earth. Now, when man was created, he was created on what day? And Vav is the number six. Okay? So the Vav refers to a connection between heaven and earth. And here is a man who God from heaven is connecting us to planet earth. Now, the letter Vav not only is the number six, it literally means like a hook. Something that connects two things. All right? Well, since the Vav has also become the 22nd letter, and how many letters are there in the Hebrew alphabet? 22. It means it's attached here to the sixth word, and it alludes to the creative connection between all of the Hebrew letters, because words are made up of what? Letters. And in the beginning was the Aleph Toph. In English, we would say A to Z, which means... A to Z means every word. 
Well, in Hebrew, and I'm, you know, when God spoke, he spoke in Hebrew. He didn't use English. He said, yeah, he or, which means let there be light. So Hebrew is the heavenly language. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, when Paul gets knocked off his high horse, he said, I heard in the heavenly tongue. And he spoke in Hebrew. Okay, so let's see. The first time you see the Aleph Tav representing God is in the fourth word. Okay, so here we go. The fourth word. Well, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So the fourth day represents the four thousandth year and Messiah's first coming. Well, then what happens? The next time that it appears is over here with the Vav Aleph Tav, the sixth day, which is where we're at, representing his second coming. At this time, you have the Vav Aleph Tav, which means the second time the Aleph Tav comes, he's been pierced. They will look upon the Aleph Tav who's been pierced. We, we see all of this right here in the beginning. So here we have Yeshua as both the Vav and the Aleph Tav, God and man. Vav represents man, Aleph Tav represents God. So here we have one coming back representing both God and man who has been pierced. So here we have right there in the first verse of Genesis 1, the first and second comings of the Messiah. So that was the first day. So now we come to the second day. The second day, we see God divides the waters from the waters, and he makes the firmament uh, in the middle. He separates the waters above from the waters below. Okay, the second day, the first day is Sunday. The second day is Monday. All right, so on Monday, what's interesting, there is no mention of it being good. How come there is no good for Monday? Rainy days and Mondays always get me down. <laughs> now, mon the reason why is because things weren't finished. So God gives a double good on Tuesday. Let's look and see. Go to Genesis 1, 9 through 13. It says, God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered to one place and let the dry land appear. It was so. God called the dry land earth, the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth the grass, the herb yielding seed, the fruit bearing uh, trees, bearing fruit, wherein the seed uh, thereof on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, herb yielding seed after its kind, tree bearing fruit. Wherein is the seed and after its kind? And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and morning a third day. So here, Tuesday is a double good. I think what's interesting, it talks about bearing fruit, wherein is the seed. And what has GMO done? They want to take the seeds out of your watermelon. They want to take the seeds out of everything. So you can't control the production. They can control the production. This is the state of the earth today, GMOs. But the problem is we know the word is compared to food. And a lot of people GMOing the word of God. They are polluting their Bible and their teaching. And you're getting GMO word of God. Because the word of God is like into a seed that's planted in the ground. And rocky and trees and everything else. Well, guess what? A lot of us got to be careful what we're eating because you're eating garbage. That's what you're being fed. Okay, so now the fourth day is Wednesday. And it says in verse 14 through 16, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for what? Signs. Signs. Seasons, days, and years. And as you know, the season, days, and years is not what you think it is. It's referring to Shemitah years, Jubilee years, Holy days, Sabbath days, feast days. Okay? And then 
it says, let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so, and God made the two, what lights? Great lights. A greater light to rule the day, a lesser light to rule the night. Okay, I think it's fascinating. He calls them two great lights. You know, it's, think if you have two kids. Oh, you're both great. But then at the same time, one's greater than the other. But you let every kid know they're the same. They're all great. No? <laughs> Maybe great in different ways. But I think it's interesting that a large and small moon and sun, from God's perspective, they are both great. And then in Genesis 1, 17 through 19, it says, God set, set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and the night, to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. Okay, since so in the very beginning of my announcements, I talked about the eclipse that happened today. Well, I want to go over some things with you that I find so fascinating. Number one, here is the sun. Do you see the earth, that little dot at the end of the yellow line? Okay, do you see the moon? I don't think so because I didn't put anything there. <laughs> but my point is, if the earth is that small, do you think you could even see the moon? So how in the world can the moon block the view of that giant sun when it gets between the earth and the sun? That little tiny moon can make the whole sun turn black. What is going on here? I mean, here's the earth, and there's a little tiny moon next to it, okay? And yet sometimes you will notice the sun and the earth or the moon look the same size. How can the sun and the moon both look the same size? And that's how you have a solar eclipse. When the moon comes between the earth and the sun, how can it block that out? Well, here is the deal. The moon's orbit is elliptical. It's called the apogee and the perigee. And so when it is the furthest away, it's 405,500 kilometers. And when it's at its closest, it's 363,000 kilometers. So that's why a moon can look real big or a moon can look real small. It depends on where it is at in its orbit. So here we have the Earth and this little tiny moon blocking the entire sun. So you can see the umbra and the penumbra. That's why some eclipses are called penumbral because they don't, it's not a total eclipse. It's falling in the shadow. And so here, that moon causes an eclipse. Now I had that gold ring around it because this one was called an annular eclipse, which basically means the moon was probably at apogee when it got in the middle and so it didn't cover the whole sun. But when it's at perigee and the sun, it's between the sun and the earth, then it's going to block the whole thing and have a total solar eclipse. Does that make sense? Yes. So when it, it depends on where the moon is, whether it's going to be a total solar eclipse or not. But now, in the Bible, we just read that he created the sun and the moon for what was the number one reason? Sign. Signs. And the Hebrew word is ot. All right. Well, guess what? The letter Tob means sign. It means a mark. Matter of fact, remember in Ezekiel when God said he's going to destroy everything, but he said, first, don't destroy any of those upon whom is my mark. Right? The Hebrew word for mark there is sign. All about Tob. So the mark is God's signature. Just like they used to put X marks the spot. And if you couldn't read or write and you had to sign it, you'd put in your X on it. Because X means sign. And in the ancient Hebrew, the Tav was like a cross or an X. Now, let me see what I have here. Oh, I, let, me, oh, let me fix that. Can you guys read that? No, not really. Okay, so just a second. Time for a quick fix. I don't know why that happened. Let me just move. There we go. When we're that down there, we'll try it again. Hmm, hmm, hmm. 
Okay, get a load of this. The number for sign uh, is uh, the word uh, ot, and the last letter is tav, which means sign. And the whole reason that you can see eclipses and God created them for signs is because the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, and it's also 400 times closer. The result is that from Earth, they appear to be the same size. So if I hold my finger up, I can block out Dolores' whole face. That doesn't mean my thumb is as big as her face. It's size and distance. God created the sun and the moon for signs, so he created them at the ratio of 400 to 1, and the letter Tav, which means sign, is a numerical value of 400. I mean, only God can do that. Now, something I want to point out, too, uh, this here is one of the, the art pieces in the calendar that people can uh, download or get, but I want to explain something to you here. Let me bring it in a little bit closer. Do you see the brace sheet? This is the first word of the Bible. Do you see in red it says, in the beginning? That's the word, bear a sheet. And then created God, Elohim, the heavens, and the earth. And the all of Tob, there is no meaning or definition. So here, do you see the very first word, which is what? Bear a sheet. Let's make it bigger. In this art piece, which you can see when you get it up close, there is the word what? Bear a sheet. Every letter, there's 22 letters, so every letter is also a place value. So the bait is the second letter. Race is the 20th letter. Aleph is the first letter. Shin is the 21st. Yud is the 10. And the letter Tav is the 22nd letter. So if you were to add up the value of that word, it's 76. Does everyone understand that? Just like Roman numerals. Every letter has a numerical value or place value. If you add up that first word, it equals 76. So you can see right there where that is in that art piece. Okay, so now if we go back to this, you see the 76 and you add up all the way to the very end, you get to 298 if you add up the value of every one of the Hebrew words in that first verse. Well, it so happens, 298, the numerical value of that verse, times 10 squared, which is 100, and I can't think, help but think of Abraham who turned 100 when he gave birth to Isaac, equals times 10 squared, 29,800 meters per second, which is the exact amount of the orbital speed of the earth around the sun. So in Genesis 1, 1, when you add up the first time the word earth is mentioned in the Bible, it actually gives you the orbital speed of the earth around the sun, 29,800 meters per second. And you just simply find that by adding the numerical value of the first words. Only God can do that. But that's why I really like that particular art piece. Okay, so now, let's see. Okay, what is a human being? What are you? What are you made up of? Dirt, what else do you have to have? Skin, water, how about some blood? We gotta have blood. Okay. This is only in Hebrew, guys. Here, God made Adam. That's Adam. See that? Aleph, Dalet, Mem. A-D-M. Adam. All right? Well, get a load of this. From these three letters, I can tell you about the most important things that you need to know as to who you are. This Hebrew word defines, it means what? Adam means... Mankind. Okay. Well, get a load of this. Are we a tripart being? Okay. Three letters. Body, soul, and spirit. We're a tripart being. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, 
soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. So we can see the name of Adam tells us we're a three-part being. It also tells us we're created in God's image because the Aleph is the first letter of God's name. But wait, there's more. Okay. <laughs> if you see here, Adam comes from Adama, and Adama means dirt. We came from dirt. That Adam tells us we came from dirt because it comes from the word Adama. Now, <clears throat> if you'll notice, in Gen I have Genesis 2-7, and I have a Hebrew word there. And if you look at your notes, Genesis 2-7 and 8, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had made. Okay, what's fascinating about this, the word for formed in Hebrew is this word right here. And I want you to notice there are two yods. Do you see that? The vav, two yods, sade, and resh. Yod means what? Hand. hand. God used both his hands to make man. He got personally involved in the garden. Okay, let me see where I'm at. Then you have uh, doma. You see the word doma? Well, if you'll notice, right here, we also have doma, which basically is dirt. But that word, it comes from this word that means stuff, substance. So if you don't put God in your life, you're just walking dirt. You're just a bunch of mud walking. So I'm going to show you how actually your DNA and how you're different from a monkey like they think you came from. Okay? Guess what? When God made the beasts, there's only one youth. It's the very same word formed in English, but it's a different Hebrew word showing you that it's defective. There's a yud missing. God just used one hand when he made the beast, but he used two hands when he made you. So we're not evolving from a beast. Now, I think it's also interesting in Genesis 2, 7, 8. When you think of the Garden of Eden, how beautiful it is. When God created it, did God create the Garden of Eden? No, he didn't. He didn't create it by speaking it. It says the Lord God planted the garden. He purposely came just like you want to get the nursery ready for a newborn. God wanted to get the house of the earth ready for his newborn. So what does Yeshua do? He comes and he plants the garden of Eden. And then it says he creates the man and puts him in the garden that he had planted. That is crazy. He's personally involved. And as a matter of fact, many people believe that the Garden of Eden, and I do too, was actually in Jerusalem. Okay? Well, if you remember, when Yeshua resurrected, this, Yeshua says to this woman, why are you weeping? And she say, he says, who are you looking for? And it says she supposed him to be the gardener. He was. He planted the garden 4,000 years earlier. He was the gardener. Now, it says in Genesis 2, 18 through 20, the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone, so I will make a help meet for him. And so out of the ground, the Lord God, what? Formed every beast. That's this word, formed. It's the same form, but it's a different spelling. And every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called the creature, that was the name, and Adam gave names to the cattle. Can you imagine? It says names. I would have gone cow and moved on. But he gave all these different cows different names. And so into the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helpmeet for him. Do you know what that word helpmeet is? It's at ser. And it actually means an ally. As a matter of fact, when you break the Hebrew letters down, the helpmeet is someone who sees the enemy coming. 
That's what the woman is. She's to be the one that sees the enemy coming because guys are so involved in the work, they don't see what's going on around them. So the woman's job was to see what's going around them, and she was to protect the man. That's why in a Hebrew wedding, the bride walks around the man seven times. She surrounds the man as a wall of protection, protecting him from all others. Now, when it says whatever he decided to call them, well, I mean, think about this for a minute. How many of you guys would love to have a T-Rex to defend you? <laughs> or a lion? Or a bear? What that word that there means is protector. And so here, all these eagles and gigantic dinosaurs and everything come before Adam, and he's going, none of these can protect me. That's what he said. God said, you need a good woman. She can protect you far better than these animals. Why? Because who's the enemy? Satan. What good is a dinosaur going to do against the adversary, Satan? Sometimes we don't know the battle, which is where we're going into a battle, and we don't know who the enemy is. We end up attacking each other because we don't have our priorities straight. But for example, do you know what the name for dog is in Hebrew? What? Remember Joshua and Caleb? It's Caleb. That's what it means. Well, do you know what Caleb means? And you know this about dogs. You have the word lev, which is heart. A dogs are all heart. When Adam names these animals in Hebrew, he was telling you about the substance of what that animal was. But now, let's take a look at you. Here we go, Adam. It comes from the word Adama, which means dirt. So we're all made of dirt. Then what do we find? We also, Dom is blood. You have that blood. Guess what? You also, Adam, that mem, symbolizes water. And we know we're made up of water. Also, Adam, the first two letters, means a fog or a vapor. And what does the book of James say? We are but a fog or a vapor. So right here, in this one word, we see we're a tripart being. We come from dirt. We have to have blood. We have to have water. And we're just a fog, a wind that passes away. And that tells you all about mankind in the one letter for man. Everything is there. The chemical language is so close. But when you look at the ancient font that Moses used, a dom, the way he drew it was like this. The Aleph was an ox, because it means ox. The Dalit was like a tent door. It means door. And the Mem, if you turn it upside down, it almost looks like RM. But it meant crashing waves of water. It symbolizes water, but not calm, peaceful water, but like a tsunami, waters of chaos. So when we look at Adam's name, we see also, as the Aleph is the first letter, he was the leader or the first one to enter the door into chaos. Mankind. So you can see how there's 70 levels. Just that word breach sheet. There's so much more I can give you, but I don't have time. But we have to understand there are levels and levels and levels when we want to dig deep into this stuff. Okay. I had to skip some stuff, and I may have some of your verses because I switched them around, but they're all there. Matter of fact, in James 4.14, it says, Whereas you don't know what will be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even what? A vapor. That just right there. We just saw that we're tripart being created in, from dirt, created in the image of God. The life of the flesh is in the blood. We're mostly made up of water, but we're also a vapor when it comes to the reality of God Himself. Okay, Genesis 2 16 and 17. This will come as a surprise. Did you know Eve wasn't kicked out of the garden? Only Adam was. Did you know Eve never heard the commandment about not to eat of the tree of life from God? She wasn't even created yet. That's why he had all the animals come first. And there wasn't a help me found, and then he produces Eve. But Eve wasn't there when Adam was given the command not to eat of it, so he's the one who added to the word of God. Don't even touch it. That's why the Bible says don't add to God's word. Don't take away from his word. And so look at this. It says in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, the Lord God commanded Adam, the man, 
saying, of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat it from the day you eat thereof. You, singular, will surely die. Eve hadn't been created yet. And so what do we see in chapter 3? Because of the sin, therefore the Lord God sent who? Him from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from where he was taken. She wasn't taken from the ground. She was taken from him. So he drove out who? The man, Adam. And he placed uh, at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim, flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. All right. She just kind of followed along. Which way do we go? Which way do we go? Well, now get a load of this. This one's incredible. When you see that Adam within it is the word for blood, Dom. You may not have ever seen this before. This was one of the most phenomenal things that I ever realized when I saw this. In Genesis 4, 9, and 10, the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, oh, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. Guess what? That's a wrong English translation. It says the voice of your brother's bloods, plural. All of the generations that he were never going to be born are crying from the ground. It's not your brother's blood. It's your brother's bloods. Because he killed them. He wiped out every generation. Now in Genesis 4, 25 and 26. It says, Adam knew his wife. She bore a son and called his name Seth. For God has appointed me another seed instead of Abel. Well, guess what? Seth means to be appointed to. So his name isn't Seth. His name is appointed. Okay, but we transliterate. And it says, for Cain slew him. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son. And he called his name Enosh. And then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Do you know how horrible that English translation is? If you read, that's when men begin to call upon the Lord, what do you think? God, help. No. That's when men begin to curse the name of the Lord. That's what the Hebrew says. That is when men begin to curse the name of the Lord because of the earth wasn't responding like they had wanted. And then in Genesis 5, 3, look at this. And Adam lived how many years? And he begot a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name what? Sat. Okay. I have my chart here, which is free online. This shows you all the first begats. So here, Adam and Eve, this would be year one. And you go to year 130, that's when Seth was born. So if Cain had just killed Abel, they were like 125-year-olds fighting. They, they, or maybe they killed each other when they were 10, but then God or Adam waited 120 more years to have a kid. So, I mean, just think about it. You have two choices. Either they were fighting when they were 20, and then they waited 110 years to have another kid, or those two were like 120 years old when they were fighting. Are you following me? I don't know if you ever looked at that, but they were 130 years old when they replaced Seth. I thought it was fascinating. Okay, but anyway, I have this chart, and it has all of the generations, uh, and each one of these are 550 years, each page. Well, the, the first page is here. This is 500 years, 500 years, so 1,000 years go by, and then you have a, another 1,550 years, and then the flood happens. So you're talking a long time until the flood came. Okay, we're going to wrap this up here. Okay, so... Genesis 5.1, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Now, I want to bring something up here. In Genesis 2.4, earlier, it says, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. I always think that's fascinating. How can you have many generations in a day? But aside from that, here you go. Genesis 2.4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. Genesis 5.1, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Same English word, but guess what? In Hebrew, there's something wrong. Does anyone catch it? That Vav is missing. 
And what did I say? What happens when a letter is missing? It's defective. God intentionally misspelled words in the Hebrew. But man in the English tries to correct them, and they mess everything up. There's a reason he had that Bob missing. Why? Here, when he creates everything, it's perfect. But once Adam sins, the Bob, which is the connection between heaven and earth, disappears. The connection's broken. So God is waiting for the right man who's going to come, who's going to restore. And what do we see? Do you know that the word toldot is misspelled every time in the Torah? Another 70 sometimes it's always misspelled. Guess when the Vav comes back? When is that connection between heaven and earth made? It's in the book of Ruth. Now, these are the generations of Peretz who ends up begetting King David. He's the missing man who's going to connect heaven and earth again. That's why in Matthew 1, when it mentions the books of the generations of Yeshua, it doesn't start with Adam. It doesn't go to Noah. It doesn't go to Abraham. It goes to the son of David. He's the missing man. So, let me just think. All right, yeah, I'm pretty much done. I, I skipped a bunch of stuff. Um, and then the Genesis 6 really is, uh, well, 1 through 3 is when it talks about men begin to multiply on the earth. They had kids. And then it says the sons of God saw the daughters of men and they took wives. A lot of people think, I think completely wrongly, that the sons of God are demons. How can the sons of God be demons? And we're called sons of God in the New Testament. I don't know if any of you are a demon. You may act like one, but you're not. Okay. <laughs> and then in Genesis 6, 4, and 5, there were giants in the earth. That means big bullies. Uh, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, they bare children, and the same became mighty men, which were of old. And God saw that the wicked man, wickedness of man was great in the earth. Every imagination, thoughts of his heart was only what? Evil. And how often? Continually. The amazing thing about that verse, there's a difference between a child running through the house, knocking the vase over, and it breaks in two, and a teenager who's staring in your eyes, picks up the vase and hurls it against the wall and shatters it into a thousand pieces and can't be put together. There's like 10 different levels of sin. We have downstairs uh, the Hebrew of all the different levels. But this one here, evil is raw, and it means to intentionally and purposely destroy something so it's beyond repair. And that's how man was. And that's what we're doing to the earth today. A lot of common things. And so I'll close with this verse, Genesis 6, 6 to 8. It says, it repented the Lord that he made man, and it did what? Grieved him in his heart. The word grieve means to sob so much you have difficulty in breathing. God was so upset he had difficulty breathing when he saw what the world had turned into. And so he says, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth. But look at this. Not only will I destroy man, but every beast, every creepy crawler, even the birds of the air. For he pens me that I've made them. But fortunately, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Wow. It grieved God. And to me, that's the thing that brought me to repentance more than anything. Because I, most people don't want to sin uh, because of the consequence. I'm going to go to hell. And most people want to do good. Why? Because they want to be blessed. And I think both those are wrong. Uh, the reason why I stopped sitting because I didn't want to break God's heart. And that's really what it was all about. But why in the world were the beasts, creepy crawlers, and birds destroyed? What did they do? You ever think about that? Why were they destroyed? Well, first off, we have to think about it. God created man to rule over all those things. And if there's no man, you don't need those anymore. Let's stand. And let's pray. Avinu Mokenu, our Father, our King, I just uh, thank you so much for everything that you're doing in waking all of us up. God, we want to wake up. Father, we need to wake up. I pray, Lord, that you would inspire everybody here to dig into your word. There's so much more that's there. And we're so grateful that you called us your kids even as you told Moses to tell Aaron to pray over my kids. And not only will I bless them, but I'm going to put my name upon them. And this is what he said to say. Ivarekaka Adonai Vaish Mareka. 
Ya er Adonai panavileka vichuneka. Isa Adonai panavileka viasem laka shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in that most wonderful name. Eh, yeah, I share. Eh, yeah. Amen.